our two speakers are ready, uh, Mon and EDCV. Here uh, they will talk about talk something about the insecurities of VoIP uh, telephony and how to uh, make use of that. So please give them a welcome round of applause. <laughs> So, the title is a bit generic. It's not about all the VoIP phones. So we, what we did here is just uh, took some phones and uh, tried to reverse um, the code they are running and uh, what, uh, look what we can do with that. So, um, first, I uh, will introduce uh, a bit of context about uh, architecture and uh, yeah, wha what are the motivations behind this work. Then I'll show you some, uh, well, I explain the typical uh, baseband architecture so that you, you can know uh, what we are trying to analyze be behind that. And then we, we go in the technical details with um, analysis of a firmware update image. Uh, in this case, uh, we have phones that run VxWorks, so maybe you are not familiar with that, and uh, we will uh, explain some things we can do with that and how to, uh, to take advantage, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, what we can do with VxWorks and uh, what, uh, well, what are the advantages and disadvantages of it? And uh, a bit of reverse engineering with IDEA for uh, compatibility uh, purpose, obviously. And then we will show how we manage to, um, to generate a rogue, um, well, to regenerate a valid firmware to, to make a rogue update to, uh, to this kind of phone. And then we will discuss uh, uh, next direction uh, we can do uh, after this work. Okay. <coughs> so the introduction. So <coughs> embedded systems are everywhere. You might know that. And uh, here we are focusing on customer premises equipment. Uh, so it's uh, any, any telecom equipment which is um, uh, connected to a telecommunication infrastructure, but it, which is located uh, at, um, at an end user home or uh, at work, but it's outside of the um, uh, telecom operator. So it's uh, equipment you don't really own. So maybe you own it or it was uh, uh, lent to you, but it's always... Uh, um <coughs> connected to, the, uh, to a telecom operator uh, network. So it's interesting because uh, sometimes these devices are trusted. Um, it's the case of the set-top box, for, for example, which are generally on a private network of your uh, favorite um, um, internet provider. Um, or it, yeah, so when it's the case, it means that uh, if you manage to, uh, to um, to get access to this device, you will uh, probably have access to, uh, to some network you are not supposed to go. Also, they are teleco telecommunication equipment, which means that uh, it's obvious they have some spying capabilities. Actually, they are even used um, uh, for it. Uh, you, you know that if, uh, if an operator needs to, uh, to, um, <coughs> to look at your traffic, uh, some modem implements uh, a function to sniff all the traffic you are, uh, 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 that goes through your modem. So you can always um, turn a, a CP in a, well, a customer premises equipment uh, into a spying device. And also it's always uh, located uh, close to an end user. I mean always it's generally close to an end user. So if, if you need to target someone, uh, this kind of device are quite uh, useful. So, here we are focusing on the firmware update, uh, well, the firmware management, actually, because we want to, uh, to get access to it, so we, uh, we want to analyze the code that runs on it. So, you know, there is, there is always an update system on uh, this uh, type of devices because they need to address security issues, uh, even if uh, it's generally quite late when they do that. Um, sometimes they need to fix bugs, but generally when they do that, it means uh, the bug is really, really blocking for them. And uh, generally also, uh, when you get the first, uh, 
Uh, the first model of uh, CPU gen it generally has uh, a lot of unstable features because uh, everything was not released on time. So you always have some updates. Uh, you even have to update the BIOS of your uh, motherboard uh, now. Uh, otherwise, it, it doesn't work. Uh, doesn't really work on the first time. So um, we want to take advantage of it because uh, if you if you have a system a firmware update system, it means that you can uh, either download the firmware when it's manual or uh, you can sniff it when it's uh, automatic. Because your modem generally, when it's updated, you you don't have to download uh, the firmware update image. You uh, uh, yeah, the operator uh, decides for you that your modem needs to be. Uh, updated and uh, since the uh, downloading and flashing of your modem will be done automatically automatically okay so this um, firmware images they provide a lot of information uh, because they may contains the whole file system uh, if there is uh, of the devices uh, there is all the code you have also all the certificates uh, you well uh, everything that is needed to authenticate uh, the firmware and uh, authenticate the device maybe well uh, you it's something that you you can really um, uh, try to analyze to to get some information on any embedded system it's not just for a CP it's uh, just if you want to uh, to know how a camera is uh, is done, uh, well, what is the architecture behind it? You uh, you can just download the firmware and see what operating system is running on it and on uh, on which processor and uh, what kind of ASIC or uh, DSP there is, not for a camera but for anything. Okay, <clears throat> so it's an, uh, an alternative method um, of doing it rather than using a JTAG, which is the, the usual way of uh, of uh, how to say uh, of analyzing uh, an embedded device. And so the advantage of this method is that you uh, you don't need a physical access to the device. You don't need any hardware or um, software which is specific uh, for JTAG because you need a probe for JTAG and you need uh, a software that uh, well uh, you well you need the JTAG servers that will decode uh, for your processor or DSP uh, exactly, and then you can put a debugger on top of it. So instead of it, we will be using uh, xdump, which is uh, well not uh, as uh, useful as uh, what you can do with a JTAG console, but it's still uh, giving a lot of information. And uh, yeah, the downside of this uh, method of analyzing the firmware update is that, uh, contrary to JTAG, you don't have access to everything. You can't modify uh, um, values in memory uh, during runtime. You you can't dump information. You can uh, the only thing you can get is what is inside the the binary. Uh, so <clears throat> now I will uh, show you uh, just an example of uh, baseband architecture. So uh, the baseband is uh, the chip that is connected to um, to the telecommunication infrastructure uh, on one side, and on the other side it's connected to. Uh, well, if it's a modem, it will be an Ethernet connection. Uh, if it's uh, if it's an, an SD, SDIO card, it will be SD, uh, SDIO. If uh, it can be SPI, it can be uh, PCIe, it can be anything on the other side. So it's just uh, it's just chips that um, that is directly connected to the <coughs> to the telecom infrastructure and uh, generally only uh, manage the layer one and layer two. Uh, um, uh, layers of the, uh, for the network. So here it it doesn't really um, well it does the IP actually. So yeah, well let's go. So it's a typical. Uh, on a pad, uh, pointer laser. So <clears throat> uh, it's a typical uh, system on chip for a uh, baseband. It, uh, it's exactly the same architecture you have for uh, an LTE, actually, an LTE uh, chip or a WiMAC chip or a 3 d chip. And uh, here it's for a VoIP. So you have the analog uh, front end, which is connected to your uh, RG11 um, um, te telephone line. And on the, other, on the other side, since it's VoIP, you generally have Ethernet. Um, uh, but here for VoIP, uh, the, the Ethernet uh, is uh, used for something else. Um, <coughs> uh, it's for uh, the replicating, actually. It's not 
It's a generic uh, scheme. So you have a flash and a run, and inside the system of chip, which is what we, uh, we analyze only uh, this part, you have uh, a processor, a simple processor, generally ARM or MIPS. MIPS is when it's generally when it's plugged in the power supply because it uh, consumes more than ARM, but ARM is cheaper, so, uh, ARM is more expensive, so that's why you will um, uh, choose MIPS if you don't have a power consumption problem and if you uh, if your uh, power consumption uh, if you have some issues with power, power cons consumption because you're running on batteries you will choose an arm and then you generally have a DSP which is talking to the analog front end and an ASIC which is uh, accelerating a, um, all the layer one processing. So what we are interested in here is uh, having the, the content of the flash, and we can download it from the internet. So here is the correct scheme for uh, the chip we uh, will be focusing on, which is uh, Broadcom 1101 uh, VoIP Ethernet uh, CP engine. So you, you still have the flash, CSD RAM, here you connect the analog front end, here you have the Ethernet port, and here you have what I was talking about, like SPI uh, serial or GPIO. And you have the MIPS, the, Z the DSP, and the JTAG. So it's where you want to plug in if you have, uh, if you have what, uh, what it takes to do it. Yeah. <coughs> And here it's uh, software that runs on this, uh, the classical architecture of the software that runs on this chip. Uh, so I've divided into, because uh, several actors are uh, implicated in this kind of design. Uh, generally, um, the operating system, real-time operating system, is provided by uh, 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 an external entity. Uh, so here is uh, the example for, uh, for baseband, uh, generally you will find VxWorks. It was 75% uh, of market share um, uh, five years ago. Now it's, co it's more and more Linux instead of VxWorks. You can have RT Linux, Montavista Linux, because uh, you have Nucleus, QNX, a lot of uh, real-time operating systems that have a small foot footprint. Um, this operating system uh, comes with uh, op applications and services, which, can, which is a vector for, uh, for vulner vulnerabilities, because generally it's not up to date, and uh, you always have some uh, very outdated applications that runs on it. And sometimes I forgot to uh, deactivate it. Um, then you have the system on chip manufacturer. So here it's Broadcom, the company who made the, the, the chip itself. Uh, so they need to, uh, to provide the board support package and the, the L2 stack for, uh, for the baseband. And then you have the, the final, uh, the original design manufacturer, which is the company to which you will buy your, uh, uh, your wall device. So here it's uh, Astra, we will see. And uh, so you, it's just to show that uh, when analyzing this this blob of code, uh, you will have uh, three different, at least three different, uh, three very different parts of the code. Okay. And then, so I will uh, talk now, hello everybody, about the, how to uh, analyze the firmware update format. So we will manually use uh, some standard Unix tools, uh, common line tools like uh, XDAM, strings, DD and file. So this tool uh, for beginning will help us. Uh, the fun we will be focusing on very fun using the Broadcom BCM 1101 system on chip uh, that uh, he has been talking about previously. Uh, we already know that it's MIPS 32 bits, uh, probably began Gen. Uh, and uh, so we have been working on the Astra brand. Astra sells. Uh, on the uh, on consumer equipment c going from uh, simple sim phones to phones with more functionalities like they have extension you can call more people you can transfer call and so on and they are plugged on your uh, most uh, companies network so as uh, a model as a 6753e which is a new version of the 53e So when we look at the, at the file, we, we, we downloaded all the firmware from uh, Astra website, uh, uh, which is a big zip with uh, many firmware for every uh, uh, model of it. 
So the first thing we do is file on the, on the, on the, the command file, which tells you it's just binary data. So looking, looking with xdump, we will start to look for some known patterns, like, uh, like uh, file signatures. Uh, uh, people doing reverse mostly look for MZ pattern. Here we are looking for uh, maybe a compression algorithms. And at offset one, uh, 116, I guess, uh, you have here one uh, F8B, which is the header of uh, JZIP stream data. So using DG, we will, uh, and we we can uh, guess that the first integer is uh, the offset to the uh, is the offset to the JZIP stream data. Uh, so with DD, we extract it to a new file, uh, and uh, we JZIP the data we have extracted. Uh, there is nothing else after the JZIP data in the file. So using file again, we still have uh, we still have just data. So xdump xdump sorry xdump give no, give us uh, nothing more. So we'll use uh, strings uh, to look for a uh, non-string anything which can help us guess what is uh, in that in that file. On looking for some pattern, we were able to find that there was this line, uh, which is a boot command line option for VxWorks. Uh, so now we are uh, mostly we we can guess that it's VX, it's sorry it's a VX works which we we know it is loaded at x zero uh, x thousand four thousand in memory it's uh, MIPS uh, uh, big and done as we already told it uh, and it's flat memory model with no MMU this is for performance this means that all tasks are running in the same uh, memory space. Uh, so now we will try to, to, to load a, our uh, image in, a, in a IDA. And uh, the problem is that we have actually no information at all. No function, no function, no references, no strings. Uh, no, you can see that on the top, the analyst bar is still brown because nothing has been analyzed yet. So the point here is to to, to find some information in the file, and we'll try to, to reconstruct the, the symbol table. So for this, we will uh, use, uh, again, our command line tools. Uh, first one, we, uh, we try to, to look for non-function from VxWorks. Uh, VxWorks are one function, which, which is sysinit. It's the main uh, initialization function, which is called most of the time at the startup. It's uh, mapped at uh, Xerix uh, 8000 and 4000. So using grep, we will find the offset of the string in the binary, and uh, we compute then the real address of the, of the address of the string, sorry. So the address, we just add uh, Xerix uh, 800, 4000, which give us the, where is located the string in memory. And we then search this address in the binary. The objective is to find one entry of the symbol table, which will contain the pointer to this uh, string. Uh, so the first address we get, upon we get uh, the same uh, 5,000, 4,000, we get one entry of the symbol table. From the, there, we made a simple script, which finds the start address on the only address of the symbol table. So we go back in memory until we found uh, 16 null bytes finding error, which is just before the starting address of the symbol table. And to find the end, we do the same process, uh, browsing the me memory until we found uh, 16 null bytes uh, followed by, uh, I guess, 0xffff7fff. And this is the end address of the symbol table. Um, well, just to give a little bit of context, VxWorks comes with a shell, which is actually a debugger, and the commands you give in the shell are in C, assembly, or ADA. Uh, so since you can call any, sim any symbol, it means that VxWorks is always shipped with a symbol table and all the address of all the functions so that you can call them in the shell. So you've, uh, we've taken advantage of that, uh, knowing that uh, there is uh, a symbol table which is in VxWorks proprietary format, 
to uh, to try to find it and then to uh, to give it back to our um, to our disassembly software, which is IDA. So that's why we were looking for um, for the pattern to uh, where it could be in the in the binary, and so. So we have uh, for now we have the starting address and only address of uh, of the symbol table. We will use this letter, and now we have to type the memory in uh, in IDA so that it will be able to uh, make further analysis later. So we will create each entry of the symbol table. So this is the format. You have a sim tab ID, which we don't care. The second, uh, which is. Uh, I guess there may be an error. The first symbol is the name, yes, it's okay, is a pointer to the string in the string table. And the second, the value field is the real address of the symbol. The just swap the commands. And then in type, there is not much. On groups, uh, contain the flags. Uh, and this flag will tell where, where relies the, the symbol, if it's in the BSS, data section, or text section. And this will be important. So the first thing, we, for each entry of the symbol table, we use make the word and make word to create the appropriate types. And then using a make function, we can tell uh, to IDEA, OK, at this address, this is a function. And it will make IDEA start the analysis and build the graph and references. And then the last one, make name, it's, uh, it helps you push a new function in the function list on the left one, so that you can uh, search for function more easily later. So after this step, running the script, uh, we get this version of uh, IDEA. So you can see now we have function name, we have uh, cross references, so we can browse more easily the file. On the top bar, the analysis was done on, I guess, a quarter of the memory. And, uh, and you have symbol re resolution. Uh, uh, so now we can use really there. Uh, we will look for uh, interesting function. So most of the time, uh, function related to authentication. So we look for a pattern like uh, auth, login, user, password, uh, access, all the strings which can uh, lead you to some interesting function. And in this binary, we found the login user add function, which uh, was called from user security and user root. And so, uh, thanks to uh, cross references, we can go back in the backtrace the function to get its parameter. And so, in user security, we found that here on the last three lines, you, are, you got two variables push in, a, well, not push, put in the parameter register. Obviously, the first one looks like a username, and the second one is uh, some kind of hash. Uh, so we had to reverse the hash function to, uh, to know if we could uh, break the password in some way. So we have found the login default encrypt, which is called later on the call graph. And after a few uh, reversing, reversing, sorry, we have come to a quite simple algorithm. Uh, so this just compute a simple CXC, uh, adding each character of the password with uh, xoring it with its position in the in the string, and then uh, it uh, multiply it by a magic number. What is um, on the last section? It's uh, translated to uh, uh, in a ASCII string. So that means memory. It's just. Uh, well, it's translated it into ASCII, but there's just a second pass of encoded, which uh, swap some uh, character to some others. And this is the way the hash is computed. What, i what is wrong in this uh, computation, so this is a mathematical function, what is wrong is that it multiplies uh, two uh, integers, uh, which lead uh, sometimes to uh, uh, an integer overflow. Uh, and the hash is truncated to 32 bytes. This brings many collisions and can probably be easily brought for said. Um, so we have uh, wrote a simple treat using some single pattern, uh, which is just uh, the, the password is uh, going from 8 character to 40 characters. So we set a first character, and then for the last one, we just pad it and try it 
bit some super bread force on here. So on this hash, we were able to find, uh, I guess, nine collisions. Um, we have tried on some others. It mostly always finds some collisions. Uh, and so here it is now. We were able to log on the phone using Telnet. Um, Yeah, because uh, the telnet was um, in this kind of phone, and it's not the only one. Um, the telnet from VXWorx was still up. So if the phone is, in the, is on the same network as the other computer, anybody can log in. And the hash we've just reversed was the default hash of VXWorx. So basically, anybody can take control of the phone. And since you have a shell where, where you can call uh, the C symbol, it means that you can... Um, well, if you want, you can turn on the microphone uh, and uh, and uh, call so well uh, call someone and turn on the microphone so that you can just listen to whatever is uh, uh, saying. Okay, so now we will look at how the, we will finish the uh, firmware analysis with the authentication method because there are, there were some um, in a previous slide. I don't know if I can go back. Yeah. Here, uh, the part in white, uh, we still haven't decoded it because the first one is just uh, a size and then we have the JZIP binary image. And between this is just some random numbers. Okay, here. And um, we can uh, first uh, see that there is some uh, three uh, ASCII character, which is generally a signature. So uh, there might be something to, uh, to look for to decode this data. Um, now that we can uh, we can uh, reverse anything in IDA, we uh, we just try to find the, the function which is responsible for um, for uh, flashing the new uh, the new firmware and first authenticating it. And this uh, function is uh, a method of the FWGuard um, uh, class, uh, which is found new firmware. And um, first we see that it. Uh, looks for the size. Uh, the only invalid size is zero for uh, for the data we still don't know anything about. And a little bit later, it will code um, FWDS codec, uh, which is a void and uh, the, the method transform. And uh, it, it seems to be the function that is uh, responsible for uh, um, not authenticating, but at least verifi verifying the validity. So um, uh, since, well, uh, here we, well, it's because we, we first uh, look uh, a bit at it. Uh, so the class FWDES codec, which is used uh, as, a, para, uh, as a, um, a function in its attribute, uh, class in its attribute, sorry, which is a triple des, which has also a class in its attributes, which is des. And uh, we've tried with Google uh, with, um, uh, with a prototype, directly the prototype of the D uh, DES and triple DES uh, uh, class. And uh, it led us to, uh, to this site with um, an implementation of DES, which is quite, um, well, not very well. It's not book DES, actually. It's not even uh, CBC. And, but it's triple DES, at least. And, um, and so when looking at the code which is available on this site, uh, because we found it through Google, uh, we find the sin signature which is in decimal here, but uh, it's exactly the same. So uh, we've, we, uh, we seem to have found the, the, the software responsible for this. Um, and you have to note also that uh, OpenSSL is uh, an libcrypt or, um, or a stati statically linked uh, in the binary image. So the, it's another example of uh, a company that used uh, their, uh, well, well, instead of using OpenSSL, which is used everywhere in their uh, code, they just used uh, some uh, weird implementation of DES, which is not even completely correct. Anyway. So now we have found the signature, which is 16 bytes. And uh, after that, we know that it's a DES, or a tri triple DES in this case, um, version of something. So now we, we want to, uh, to find the key. So we directly go to transform. And um, now it's really easy that we have all the symbols, because otherwise uh, reading uh, the MIPS assembly is not this, uh, um, I don't know, easy. 
Um, so we are interested in this uh, function, which is uh, its uh, password, and uh, it takes uh, a const car star in, uh, as an argument, which is probably the key. Well, uh, from the, the code we've downloaded uh, before, we know it's okay. And um, well, just a reminder that since we are in C++ and it's MIPS, uh, MIPS gives uh, four f uh, the first four arguments in uh, register A0, A1, A2, A3. And in C++, the first ag argument is always uh, the class. So uh, we don't care about this one. Uh, this one. We care about this one, which is uh, the, um, uh, the key is, uh, is uh, located here, actually. If we go back uh, in the code, uh, we find uh, the constructor of the FWDES codec, which takes a lot of, uh, of input. Um, so even without doing the full uh, analysis of it, we notice that um, um, the V0, the last argument actually, uh, which is probably the, uh, the key for the triple death is given uh, in V0, uh, well, is pushed on the stack and it was in V0. And so we just dump the, the table and we have a lot of uh, SKE strings and uh, ours is here. So uh, the problem of, um, well, uh, us using a symmetric uh, um, encryption algorithm for, uh, for this kind of thing is that uh, you, you've you will have the key uh, in clear in the in the binary image. So now we just uh, with DD we just split uh, <coughs> the the firmware update we had and uh, we decode with uh, the triple dash implementation we found uh, and the key we found later, and we get this uh, this clear text, and the MD uh, is uh, is uh, the gzipped image actually. So it's some kind of validation of, uh, of the firmware. Okay, so, so now that we have the keys, it's uh, trivial to, uh, to generate a rogue update because we just have to, uh, to, uh, to make the same header uh, with the uh, MDSync sum of the, of the file we want to, uh, of the image we want to, uh, to flash on the telephone. Uh, then we just uh, encode it, and uh, with a long line, uh, a long bash line, uh, we can uh, just print the two hexadecimal, hexadecimal number. Uh, well, the, the short uh, big and end, which is used for uh, for the size of the header, and then we just concatenate uh, the the gzip image at the end, and we have a valid firmware. Okay. So uh, just to sum up, the so security in, the, in this uh, firmware update resides in uh, the check of uh, MD5 sum of, uh, of an image, which is in a header, which is uh, symmetrically encrypted with uh, triple S. And uh, well, it's uh, useless because uh, we can find the key and, uh, and the, even the image is not encrypted. And uh, normally, if you want to authenticate and uh, without uh, leaking information, you, uh, they should have um, uh, <coughs> used a public key authentication so that uh, you only the, the certificates would have been, um, uh, uh, you could only find the certificates on the image and you know that the certificate doesn't, uh, well, it's just a public key, you don't care about it. It's not useful for uh, reconstructing a valid firmware, firmware image. So here it was on a specific uh, telephone because it's the one we had at this time, but uh, you, well, uh, not that uh, it's not the only telephone which is in this case. Okay, and the reversing made, made trivial with the image and all the symbols, that's funny. Okay. So first of all, we were thinking what, what we can do with, with this. I don't know if you know our, our very pay phone works now. Uh, most of them can get some uh, configuration on boot. Uh, it relies on non technologies, uh, GHCP, HTTP, FTP, uh, how it works. Uh, when some uh, very pre provider gets some new phone, most of the time it, it will, he will scan the MAC address and put it in, in a database. And the very IP provider on the other side will tell, okay, I have a new customer. I give you, I give him this phone with such a MAC address, 
and uh, it will have su such parameters. So parameter as SIP account, password, uh, register server. Eventually, you can also push some uh, a few contacts that you want everybody in the company to have. And uh, if, uh, they don't have to put the phone out, out of the box. You just take the phone to the, your, your client, you put it on the network, and it will fetch the, the configuration by your uh, network. What it does mostly, it, uh, it does a first uh, DHCP request, and it will look for the next, some of them will look for the next server option, which will point to uh, some weather, TFTP server, HTTP server, and they will ask uh, by default, first uh, default configuration file, which it could be brand.cfg, brand.xml, uh, and then a specific configuration file which is identified by the MAC address of the phone. And for many phones, it's also, it's also possible to push the, the firmware through the, this configuration file. So this means that whether if you can get on a network with very pay phone, with some rock DHCP server, you could push some update to those phones and uh, by compromising the server, of course. Okay. And, uh, well, I just to sum up uh, what I said at the beginning, because uh, since it's a telephone, you know that uh, you you can uh, you can call back someone and uh, well uh, just call someone and uh, turn on the microphone which means you have uh, a direct microphone uh, near to someone you want to spy on for example uh, you can redirect redirect calls also you can actually you can do a lot of things since you uh, you own the phone of someone else um, also the rog update c can be used to to add some functionalities so still on like uh, a large scale uh, spying in the in the in a company for example because uh, if you push an update all the all the phone in the company will have the same update uh, it's kind of critical because uh, well it's something you've certainly heard um, several times here uh, in the telecom industry uh, the security is uh, completely um, um, well, nobody is uh, aware about, uh, there is no uh, security awareness actually, uh, so it just, it's, it could be critical, but uh, it doesn't seem to be a priority, and um, I insist on it, it's, it, we did, we did it on this phone, it was quite simple actually, uh, but it's the same for uh, a lot of other phones, even if it's uh, not always v VX work, which is very, very useful to work with when you want to debug. And this is him. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you come across any uh, VoIP phones that look like they were actually done with proper security? No. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your question. <laughs> More questions? Uh, let's yeah. thank the speakers and uh, give them a well-deserved round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>